The last uh, video we talked about the history of the internet and the way the internet was impacting on life today. Uh, we're going to now look at more the multimedia aspects of internet design and working about working with the kind of things that you need to think about when you're designing for the internet. So first off, we're going to talk about text. Uh, the main thing about text that you need to understand is um, font compatibility. So different web browsers have different fonts built within them and some uh, internet browsers will display different types of fonts depending on what you have uploaded into your computer. So if you've ever downloaded a font off the internet or you know gotten it on a CD or USB or whatever, uh, you can install that font and then you can use it uh, on any design program like Photoshop, Illustrator, you can use it in Word, uh, Microsoft, uh, Google Docs, whatever it is you're using it in. But um, if you've then taken that file and opened it up in another computer, you can often find if they don't have that font installed, uh, then you can't really view the file as you would like unless you've changed it to a uh, final version of a file or embedded the fonts within that file. Or you may have to install the font on that computer too. So the same idea works with um, the internet. So we have font sets and font substitution. So the desired font that you may want to be on your website may not exist. Um, so we don't know that these fonts are going to be on the end computers because we have no way of knowing what website, what, what, what device the um, website is going to be viewed on or what computer or what uh, country it's going to be viewed at. And it may not be a standard font within that country. So what we need to do is we need to set up a, uh, a list of several fonts, so backups. So when the font that we want, let's say Times New Roman, is not available on the computer, then we go to a backup font. So we might say serif font, for example, and then it will go to that font if it can't get the one that we want. And usually any website, when you have a CSS style sheet will have the name of font, then some other backup fonts, and finally a very, um, like it'll just say like serif or sans serif or something, and it will divert to that font based on um, what the computer has on there. So yeah, we want to specify those different fonts and we give them an ordered list. Um, so at the end of the day though, it's just better to work with standard fonts that we know exist on all um, on all things. So uh, we might say like Vedana, Arial, Helvetica, Geneva. Okay, so all Microsoft systems will have um, Arial on them. All Mac systems will have Helvetica. Um, Unix systems will probably have, you know, one or the other or Vedana or Geneva or something like that. So if we create that font list, we're pretty sure that we're at least going to have something that looks pretty similar. And I mean, Helvetica and Arial are pretty, they're close to identical. There's a few little differences. So you can be pretty safe that you're going to um, be able to work with those sorts of things. Okay, so that's a good way to make sure that our um, text looks the same as we intended it to look on all devices. Um, so in, in code, we uh, do our, you know, our brackets, our font, and then we do a list of fonts with commas next to them, and then we do the uh, forward slash font in the brackets again to end that. That's HTML code. We don't need to know about this for the syllabus. Um, we really want to have our fonts to be um, proportional as well. So we want them to kind of be the same shape and size. So the safest fonts to use on the internet, if you want a sans serif, Arial Helvetica, if you want a serif font, Times New Roman or Times, if you want something that's mono space, so every letter has the same spacing, you can go with Courier New or Courier, otherwise Palatino, Garamond, Bookman and Avant Garde are fonts which usually work for everything. Anything else though, it's pretty much up in the air on whether it's going to work or not. Now, this kind of changed a little bit recently with uh, systems like Google Fonts. So if you use Google Fonts and you're visiting from a web page in Chrome, basically you can embed any sort of different font in your website. It'll cloud link up to um, 
Google font and Google font users will have access to every font that you show. So you can start using display types and fancy types, but that's only if your customers are using Chrome. So when would you not be using Chrome? Well, if you're using Firefox, if you're using Safari, if you're on your phone, the default app is Safari. That's if you're using an iPhone. You know, there's lots of times when it's usually better just to be safe and make sure that you work with it. Um, so moving on from uh, font compatibility and font substitution, you've got text as a graphic element in the syllabus. So that can be like ASCII types of um, font work. So you can use uh, those sorts of Okay, it's hard for me to explain like text as a graphic element without talking about just graphic design and uh, all of those elements to it. But I think what the syllabus is actually talking about is that really old school sort of idea of taking type and creating a picture out of characters of type, which is something we used to use before we had internet access and availability to um, create pixel or raster based images. So the idea of creating um, images with text, because we're using glyphs that are vector-based, it's a lot less space than um, creating graphic elements that are actual pictures. So I assume that's what we're talking about in the syllabus here, but we could also be talking about graphic design where we're talking about shape, um, balance, all that kind of stuff that we dealt with in the prelim course. Um, I should get around eventually to talking about that on video, but we'll see what happens there. Um, when we talk about our type of, of embedded text, we've got our true type fonts, we've got open type fonts, and then we've got postscript fonts, which aren't included in the syllabus. And there's a new emerging technology called SVG fonts, which is also not included in the syllabus. So true types are the standardization, the most used font. They can be scaled to any size because they're vector based and they're clear and readable in all sizes. They enable your fonts to be, to be quite accurate on screen. So what you type is true to what will print out. So that's why it's called true type fonts because the type is true to what will come out to it. It can be sent to any printer and it will print out like that. And as long as it supports windows, you're good to go. Uh, open type fonts are exactly like true type fonts, but they have um, more to them. So you could have small caps, old style numerals, glyphs and ligatures. So we've talked about ligatures before, that's where you combine two letters into one to make them read better typographically. Um, open type fonts are easier for designers to create. Uh, true type fonts are pretty locked down. Uh, postscript fonts are smooth, detailed and high quality. We use them mostly for professional quality printing. So you're probably not gonna come across them very often in desktop printing. Um, so it's not something we need to worry about. SVG fonts use an SVG based glyph rather than a normal, just straight vector-based glyph. Uh, an SVG is obviously a vector type file though, but what it lets you do is it lets you get um, depth and shadow and shading and all kinds of stuff so you can represent multiple colors in a font. Uh, it's a higher file size. It's only really available at the moment. So what are we like, uh, July 2019 uh, through sort of Photoshop and Illustrator, but we're seeing it being adapted over to more artistic programs as well. Okay, so. We've talked about those cascading style sheets. So when we're talking about CSS files, CSS files are essentially, it's a style sheet language that is used for, to describe the presentation of a document in an HTML document. So it enables the separation of content and style. Uh, so layout colors and fonts are what goes into your CSS. Um, it can improve accessibility because it means that um, the content is on a separate file. So let's say, for example, you're a person with a disability. So let's say you cannot see. Uh, if you were medically blind, you would need a screen reader. A screen reader can read HTML documents without having to worry about the CSS in there. It's completely separated. So all of those irrelevant styling elements are out the window and you just get the content from them. So it can also uh, provide more flexibility because it's not hard coded into the page. So we could have different CSS sheets for uh, different devices that it's being viewed on and you wouldn't have to have whole different pages for everything. You just have a single CSS style sheet. Um, it also reduces the complexity of your HTML pages and repetition because you don't need to define styles on every page of it. Um, you can also 
yeah, use voice, uh, so speech-based browser and screen readers, browse-based tactic, uh, tactile devices, and yeah, like I said, different rules for mobile devices. So that's how CSS works, but let's get back to um, HTML, which for some reason isn't specified in the syllabus. So we have to talk about CSS, but we don't have to talk about HTML. I'm gonna talk about HTML anyway, because it's important. And it's the building block of website pages. So um, images and other objects can be placed into it, interactive forms, hyperlinks, text, any of those sort of things in there. So paragraphs, structural elements, so they're all delineated by tags. So we create angled brackets. So the angled, they look like this rather than you know smooth brackets that you see normally. They are, I don't know, like what, like uh, 45 degrees or something? 45 degree angles, let's say, in the font that I've got in front of me. Um, so you can add tags such as IMG and then it knows that it's an image and then you provide either a website link to where an image is located or you can have an image uploaded to your own service and you'll link to that one and it'll display that image. To end an image, you put a slash before image in another angle bracket and it ends it. Um, you can also have paragraph tags, that's P, bold tags, which is B, um, head, which gives you a heading, um, then you can have a hyperlink, so that's A space href equals, and then you put your website, and then you put the bracket after that, and then you can put sort of like an image source after that, so then you can have an image that's clickable, and then you can add the A, and then the link finishes, link finishes. There's all sorts of stuff that you can do with HTML. Uh, it's not in our syllabus, so I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, basically though, HTML is your content, CSS is his, is his style. So, once again, just to finish, the good thing about CSS is if you change one element in your CSS, it goes over every single page. So, if we move on then to the next, uh, the next element of the syllabus, we're talking about hyperlinks. Hyperlinks are clickable links. So the clickable interactive parts of the web, um, if we didn't have hyperlinks, it would just be static pages, it would be like reading a book on a screen. So anytime you click on a link on say Wikipedia or any page where it takes you to something when you go on a Google um, search and it gives you a whole lot of pictures, basically, you know, any like blue piece of text that when you click on it, it goes purple, that's a hyperlink. Um, a hyperlink is just another address on the internet and it's kind of like a doorway to that website. So if you put a hyperlink into something, it will connect you between different pages. Any button that you press on the internet as well has a hyperlink embedded into it. You don't need to just represent a hyperlink as text. You can uh, use a picture to represent that as well. Okay, so moving on to scroll bars and buttons. So a scroll bar is basically um, a type of button or menu. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll explain the two types of scrolling elements. So obviously your normal scrolling element is the one that appears down the right side of the page. So, you know, like you can scroll up or down the page. But when we talk about a scroll bar, usually we're talking about a menu element. So a scroll bar could be like a title or a menu somewhere on your web page. And when you move your cursor into it, uh, a, like a concertina of information comes down. So like you might um, be on a clothing site and you scroll over to the mail clothing section. From the mail clothing section, a whole scroll bar comes down with like, you know, shirts, pants, shoes, socks, etc. You go into shoes and then you get dress shoes in another scroll bar, sneakers, sandals, whatever it is that you want to do. So those are then hyperlinks to that particular web page which has those different aspects of the clothing in the site. Uh, a button is literally a hyperlink but instead of it being represented by text, um, it has a picture. So a button is a pictorial element that you press on and it takes you to a different link or creates some sort of program to start or something like that. So is a button a hyperlink? Yes, but is a hyperlink always a button? No, because a hyperlink can also be text related. Um, so we've also got drop down lists. Well, okay, scroll bars, drop down lists. We've just talked about what those are there. Uh, animated text, websites can have animated text on there, I guess. Um, it so used to be a lot more um, prevalent in the on the web years ago, if I'm being honest, um, like kind of the GeoCity days of the late 90s, early 2000s, where you have sparkly text and um, text spinning around and ways to make the internet more interesting. Now we tend to do more video-based stuff uh, than animated text, but 
Scrolling text is text that just goes from one side to the other, maybe on a banner of some sort. Uh, distorting text is to change the uh, properties of the fonts. So you might stretch bits of the font, you might squish it together. Uh, you would do it for visual effect, I can't really think of any other way to do it. Uh, finally, I've been asked to talk about PDF files in text. So um, PDF files, okay, so PDF was uh, developed by Adobe in the 90s to prevent documents uh, in a manner that was um, independent of application software. So you could still open, you could open a PDF on anything. Uh, the idea was that anything would have a PDF reader. So the PDF reader would be made free to everybody. So everybody could open everything because Mac users didn't have access to Microsoft Word and vice versa. So if you created a document on a Windows computer at that time, chances are you probably wouldn't be able to view it on a Mac computer and all that sort of stuff that really seemed to matter a whole lot more back 20 years ago. So it's based on PostScript language. So we've got a complete description of a fixed layout flat document in a PDF. So there's not layers or anything, but it includes text, fonts, vector graphics, raster images, and any other information needed to display it. So no matter what, it's standardized as an open format. Uh, it doesn't require any royalties and anyone can open it. That's the deal with PDFs. So that was what it was originally supposed to do. But these days it's a lot more advanced. You can have flat text and graphics. You can have forms. You can have annotations, you can have layers on it, you can have video content, three-dimensional objects, heaps of other data. So really you can display most things in it. Um, it also can have encryption and digital sin signatures. You can attach files and metadata to it uh, and you can do all sorts of things with it. Um, PDFs are really useful. Um, my favorite thing to do with PDFs is anytime I'm sending something to print, I'll always send off a PDF because I know that it includes every element of data that I need at high quality. Um, if you don't take a PDF, you can sometimes miss out on your fonts. A good example of that is when my students are making portfolios for their industrial technology major projects. If they take it as a Google Doc or if they take it as a Word file or something like that, um, or like let's just hope they never try and take an InDesign file to um, Officeworks to get printed or any other print store to get it printed. Uh, inevitably they come back and say that the fonts aren't the same as the ones they chose. It looks nothing the same and the pictures look like crap. Okay. Um, saving it out as a PDF will allow you to, uh, make sure that what you see on screen is what gets printed out. The colors should always be the same. It should always work. So it's really good for forms and manuals because it's always going to reproduce your own original document. Unlike uh, word, which can change things all over the place. Um, it doesn't require the installation of fonts and it can give you high resolution images in a small file format. You can put a watermark on there if you really needed to, um, but it's slower to download than HTML. HTML is always gonna be smaller than PDF files. Uh, you need an Adobe Reader plugin to read it. I mean, you can always get it. Um, and you can't really edit it. Uh, a lot of um, PDFs can be edited by uh, people if they allow it to happen, but a lot of the time when you do something by default, it ends up being a uh, final file that can't be edited. Now that can be problematic for a lot of people sending a lot of files, um, but yeah, it's it's a good format. That's text, why not? So we're gonna talk about graphics on the internet now as well. And graphics on the internet used to be a much bigger deal than they are now. Uh, and that's to do with uh, file size and internet speed. So now we've got broadband, we've got the NBN in a lot of areas, we have relatively faster internet. We can talk about the fact that, you know, we're doing okay at this point in time. Uh, but a while ago, maybe like, let's say 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it really mattered. Um, back in the days when um, data on the internet was really expensive, you could go over your data plan pretty easily. Um, we really, had to worry about it a lot more. But also just the matter that uh, if your website takes a long time to load, people are generally gonna get bored with it and go somewhere else. You wanna make it as user-friendly as possible and usually it's a matter of, does it matter if the images are perfect and super high resolution for the internet? The answer is usually no. So if it doesn't, we need to look at what's more important and more important than crystal clear perfect images that'll print out nicely the size of a bus is how quickly it loads and how easy it is to view by people on all devices. You also need to think of the fact that people will now probably be, down, be visiting your site from 
a mobile instead of from a computer. That's the way that the internet is moving and there are still data restrictions on a lot of mobile plans. So compression still matters in that way. So looking at images for the internet. So we've got bitmap images first off. Okay, so the good thing with bitmap images, so those raster files that we were talking about, is that they're compatible with all browsers. So every browser can show those images, those GIFs, those JPEGs, those PNGs. Um, so most file formats on websites are going to be those bitmap formats because they are available to view on every, um, on every site. When we look at vector graphics, they're uncommon in websites and they're just not really used that much because... Um, Oftentimes, it'll just be easier to show a bitmap version of the image and then you can actually download that vector image if you um, need it to. So the problem with vectors and that sort of thing has to do with the scaling of websites. So if it's infinitely scalable, there's problems with layout and things of that nature, it's better to go with bitmap images. So when we're talking about file size and compressions of just JPEGs and PNGs, so once again, PNG is lossless. Uh, JPEG uses lossy compression, so JPEGs uh, remove data, PNGs don't do that. Um, JPEGs are the most common uh, file type found on the internet by a large factor. Most images that you find, if you try to right click and download them, will download as a JPEG. It works well, it compresses well. People on the internet don't care if you can enlarge their image or not most of the time. Uh, so they're quite happy to put low resolution images on the website because it does a job and it makes the website load quickly. A lot of the internet is going to be compressed as much as possible just to make it load fast unless you are actually looking for high quality stock art and then you can download the ones that you like but they'll usually present it in more sizes. Moving on, we have to talk about progressive loading of images. So images on the internet can load in a couple of different ways. We don't really notice it in 2019 because most images kind of load automatically. We like click our fingers and it's there when it wasn't there before. But before that, we had um, different things. So we had interlaced and we had progressive. So both of those are in the syllabus. So we have interlaced GIF files. So that is um, kind of like a Venetian blind. So the idea is that it goes line by line. So we see things slowly open up like you're opening up a a blind. So you've got a fuzzy outline of an image that's gradually replaced by seven successive waves of streams that fill in the miss missing lines. So it kind of gets clearer in lines as it loads up. So this is good if you've got a 14.4 kilobyte or 28.8 kilobyte modem and it's the year 1996, okay? So the wait time of an image seems less. So for an image to show up, you're waiting 30 seconds instead of four minutes because you can kind of start seeing it early on. So you can see a, a bumpy version. So the users can sometimes get enough information from this uh, interlaced GIF to decide to click on it or move elsewhere. So they can be like, I like it, but I'm not gonna need this single picture to show up. I'm gonna go somewhere else. So you can understand the ridicule I have by spending time explaining this, but it's in the syllabus you might get asked a question about what the difference between interlaced and disadvantages are. So the disadvantage, um, there's little difference between a GIF being interlaced and non-interlaced at this point in time because it's 2019 and you can all download images in a fraction of a second, okay? Uh, moving on to progressive, so that's JPEGs and that's what we moved for. It's similar to an interlaced GIF, but um, it's displayed in a browser window or in a series of passes. So we go blur, image is shown, then as more fills in, the clarity increases. So we start off blurry and then it goes nice and clear. And a good example of that sort of thing that you may still have noticed um, being used, and I mean, it's not the exact same thing, is to do with uh, when you're streaming video. So when you're streaming video and you don't have all the data yet, it um, kind of is blurry. And then as it buffers and you get more information, it clears and becomes more high definition. So you may have noticed that if you're using Netflix or some other streaming service. Uh, it starts off slowly and it's a little bit blurry because the resolution is low, but then it gets more progressively high definition as it loads up. Um, another thing that we can talk about is, um, well, we can talk about animated GIFs at this point. Uh, so GIFs are pretty much the only picture file type that allows movement and animation in it. So you could, of course, put a video up, but a GIF is good because it counts as a 
it counts as an image. So it can be put into image tags and things like that in HTML when normally you'd need a video player. You can set it to play automatically in a non-annoying way. I'm pretty sure it just can't have sound though and they're limited to 256 colors or something like that. So there are issues with using it as a video format. You wouldn't use it in a video format if you wanted high definition video, but if you just want a really small file size, I don't know if you memes or whatever you want to do, uh, it can work out pretty well. So that's in the syllabus. You might get asked a question about it. And then uh, we move on to the last element of pictures on the web and that's thumbnails. So thumbnails are smaller versions of pictures that you can click on and it'll show the big high definition picture. Now, where would you use that these days? Anytime you've got, I don't know, like backgrounds that you might want to be downloading to put into onto your computer, any really high, high, high resolution images, there's no point in loading them up on the page so everyone has to see them. It makes your page last too slowly. So what you do is you put really small, uh, low quality versions of the images on the page and then somebody can click on them. They're a hyperlink or a button that takes them to the website with the super high definition picture on it. Now, why are thumbnails good in this day and age? Um, it just makes things load quicker. People on the internet do not need to see full um, versions of images all the time. It'll frustrate them if their website loads too slowly. It can also use up the bandwidth of the site. So if too many people are looking at it, then that's using up too much bandwidth and that can be problematic as well. Um, you can also, I mean, you can recognize most, most images from a thumbnail. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's a toss up whether you want to show the full image in high resolution or you want people to have to click through it. Um, not everyone's going to click through to your image. So it's really the importance of the image versus the quality of the image. You've got to make these sorts of things on the web. OK, um, we also have to talk about sound on the web. So sound on the web, uh, you don't want really large files for sound on the web. So most people, when they're listening to music on the web, will take a hit for quality. Um, so especially if they're streaming something on Spotify, listening to YouTube music or any of the other um, any of the other sort of audio things at the moment, usually it'll convert it to um, MP3. So MP3 uses lossy compression to throw out the data that the human ear can't hear or that most human ears can't hear. Uh, so unnecessary pitches and silence and the sound wave, uh, the data is cut out there. Uh, the crests and troughs basically are cut and that compresses the size of it. The more you compress it, the more information you're throwing out, the worse it's going to sound. Okay, so if we listen to audio on YouTube, a lot of people often complain that it's compressed and it sounds lifeless. And that's because of that lossy compression that's put on there. Uh, there's streaming sites like Tidal that uh, profess to having higher quality audio and so that's up to people whether they prefer it or not but at the end of the day um, a lot of what people want in audio quality is problematic so a lot of people prefer the sound of vinyl to CDs even though objectively CDs have better sound um, but there's something about the distortion and warmth of vinyl that some people like so people will take a hit on the quality of sound for convenience every time usually um, or nostalgia or anything like that but on the web um, streaming audio we've got our media players at this point you've got Windows Media Player which nobody uses iTunes which is being closed down in the next few months and then moving over to Apple Music we're seeing a move away from storing content on our devices and moving towards streaming of audio uh, we're moving away from storing videos and we're also moving towards streaming that video as well on the internet at this point. So the reason for that is because bandwidth on the internet and download limits are increasing and it's more convenient uh, for us and also more convenient for content creators because content creators retain control over their intellectual property through streaming. So you can choose at any point to uh, take something off the internet if you're a streamer and it's gone. So a company could sell the rights to their, um, an example, so Friends is available on Netflix at the moment, the entire series of Friends. Next year, it's going over to uh, Warner's new streaming app. It's not going to be available on Netflix anymore. So that's something that's happened in the last couple of days. The office is moving over to NBC's streaming platform in next year at some point. So we can move these things around. But if I 
bought a DVD of something in the grand old days of 2006. I've got a copy of that forever sitting under my bed. I don't have anyone to play it at this point in time, but I could. Um, so the idea is that streaming works for consumers because it's more convenient and it also works for creators because it gives them more control over their IP. So it's going to be something that we see and keep more and more. And as connections get faster, uh, physical media seems to be dying and we're not having to worry so much about compression on the internet. It's still a thing that we're working on at the point, especially now for mobile, but we're seeing a lot of adaptive compression where things are changing based on settings that you use rather than hard-coded compression where it's brought down low. So if you have a fast connection, you can view it lossless almost. If you have a garbage connection because you're in the middle of nowhere, then it slows it down so you can still view it but at lower quality. Okay, the last thing that I want to talk about today is video. So we need to talk about the differences between hypertext transfer protocol, that's HTTP, and real-time streaming protocol, which is RTSP. So this is to do with streaming video. So we're talking about uh, like your YouTubes, your illegal download sites that stream TV. Uh, we're talking about Netflix. We're talking about live streaming like Facebook video and all sorts of stuff like that, okay? So HTTP live streaming is HTTP-based media uh, and, it's and it was implemented by Apple. So QuickTime, Safari, OS X, and iOS was where it first started. So um, you can also do it on Microsoft Edge and Firefox and some versions of Google Chrome. Support is widespread at this point. So HTTP lets the player adapt in unreliable network conditions. So without causing stalling. Okay, so what happens on an unreliable network, so when you've got a bad connection, um, we switch to a lower quality version of the video. So that's what I was just talking about before. So with that, it goes blurry. Uh, and it reduces bandwidth usage and it goes all blocky and all of that sort of stuff. So um, we can swap seamlessly from service to service with HTTP as well and it's more adaptable. So I can choose my quality level. So that's another example. Like I can go into YouTube and I can go down the 460p or whatever it is if my connection is garbage or I can go all up the way to 4k or whatever it is the highest the person's put in. Um, and then there's a variant stream where I can choose as a viewer which I want to use and it will also seamlessly go back and forth as the network's changed. Okay, so it works quite well for certain things, all right? So it's designed for all media. It, cache, it caches data more permanently. So we get these little blocks of data that we can play from start to finish and we get that buffering and um, once it's buffered, it kind of loads in and it loads ahead of time. So that's kind of like if you press pause on it, you can wait until it loads a bit more and then it works from there. When it, um, the caching is temporary. So the temporary storage of data is deleted as soon as you close the window and it downloads the file to your computer, but just little parts of it, okay? So when you close that window, it does get rid of it. It's not like you've downloaded the whole file and you can watch it wherever you want. So why don't we always use this? Sounds good that you can switch between qualities based on your um, internet speed. Well, it's not for live broadcast because it's not real time. Okay, so we can't stream out real time using this method. It's gotta be pre-done ahead of time and then we can do it after that so we can watch it back. But we need to have it recorded at the highest possible um, quality and then we create different versions of the streams and we go from there, all right? It doesn't work with the other things. But replay is easier and we don't have to worry too much about buffering. So buffering is when your video doesn't play and it needs to load and then go. Okay, so the other type of streaming is RTSP, real-time streaming protocol. And that's really more for uh, streaming media servers. So we, um, we basically, we can have video on demand with this. Uh, we can have voice recordings um, and it's made to stream video and audio in real time. That's the big thing about it. So individual packets of data, so little chunks are temporarily downloaded and then disposed of after use. So with this, we play our 30 seconds of data, which is downloaded and it's gone, okay? Um, so we're downloading smaller amounts at a time, just a little bit ahead of what we need. Um, and so this is good for watching live media and watching long videos because um, the download speed isn't consumed because we're not holding onto that data. We're getting rid of it as soon as possible. So YouTube, um, uses HTTP, TCP to buffer video, all right? So it uses that standard uh, HTTP transport, 
transfer protocol, protocol, but that's on the desktop side. Uh, for mobile devices, YouTube uses RTSP to stream it because data uh, use is more of a concern on mobile compared to um, desktop. So it slows down the device as data is being downloaded and um, basically it works better for live streaming. But of course, live streaming on YouTube, so if you watch a live video on YouTube, that would be RTSP as well. So the takeaway from this, because it can be fairly complicated, anytime there's live streaming a video, it has to be RTSP. So anytime there's real-time video being shown, you need to do real-time streaming protocol. Every time you're using HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, then you can choose different qualities to stream in, and that's good because we can seamlessly change based on our connection speed. There's benefits to both, there's negatives to both. All right, we now need to talk about webcasting. So webcasting is basically like having a TV channel on the internet. So we're talking about things like Twitch, we're talking about like Facebook Live, um, Instagram Live, I don't know, is there a Snapchat Live? You know, any of these live things, all right? So Twitch is a great example where you have gamers like playing stuff live, people watching, donating money. Um, so you simulcast your output, okay? So you can have it applying on a multi multitude of different channels as well if you want to. Um, so usually we provide a non-interactive linear stream or event. So we have someone playing a game or we have someone speaking or we have a concert and you can watch, we can watch it live. So webcasting is used a lot in commercial and um, investment sectors for presentations, meetings, Skype, that sort of thing. Uh, E-learning to, to have seminars online. Um, but it's really started to exist because of the cheap uh, proliferation of webcams and um, the availability of streaming stuff online for free. So space on the internet is cheap. Now you can have a YouTube account for free and um, you can basically just put whatever you want on there within reason. Uh, and that's allowed for really a lot of independent shows to shine in the past 10 years. You see a lot of um, people that uh, probably wouldn't have been given the time of day by commercial television networks, able to become very famous and popular through the internet, through webcasting. And that, um, when we're talking about buffering and streaming, which is the last thing we're going to talk about today, buffering is um, putting data into a reserved area of memory on your computer. So that's the buffer. So when we stream audio or video on the internet, the buffer downloads a certain amount of that video or audio before it starts playing. So hopefully we don't run out of video or audio before the next bit can download and then we can enjoy a smooth progression. Because it would suck if every time you wanted to watch a YouTube video, you needed to download the whole thing before it started. It would really... Um, make it a lot less of a smooth internet surfing experience. So instead what we do is we start downloading it just a little bit and then we play uh, and hopefully the play never catches up to the download. And these days it doesn't really with fast internet and we have, like we said, HTTP streaming protocol which can bring the quality down if it is going to be too slow to stop that from happening. But hopefully at this point we have buffering over the internet that's fast enough that streaming is not uh, impacted by buffering. So you got to understand that um, all of this data is coming from different places and uh, routers and servers from all over the world. Buffering helps us to view it uh, quickly. Okay, so the smaller your file size, the less buffering is needed. Um, it's just better if you can keep your file smaller, but some people will want higher quality videos and it's important to give them the opportunity to see that too. So the two most common files on the internet up until a few years ago were FLV, flash video format, and MP4s, okay? We don't really use flash video format because Apple decided a couple of years ago to stop supporting flash. Um, so you can't currently, from a um, iOS device, look at flash, I'm pretty sure. And we're starting to move away from the point now where you can view flash files um, without, you know, installing flash. Uh, HTML5 has made flash largely obsolete. Uh, because and the reason that Flash is made obsolete is because there's not a lot of security in there. It's very easy to put viruses into Flash files, send them to people, have them click on something, download a virus to their computer. So we've moved mainly on to MP4, uh, which is higher quality, 
Um, and it's the most common sharing format. It, the file sizes are fairly large for the internet, but we don't really care at this point because we're faster than we used to be. So it's something that we put up with because it gives us high quality picture. So that is where we are in 2019 with the web and multimedia. Unfortunately, the syllabus was written in 2008, so we need to account for those sorts of older ideas. But if we keep in mind that these sorts of things are best practice, no matter how good our internet currently is, it's usually best if we make it available to everyone so we have equity for the internet. And that's why we should always try and keep um, options available. So we can have our high definition streaming, but we should also create a lower definition stream for people that might not have as um, high quality internet. You also need to think there are other countries in the world that have worse internet than us and we need to make our files available to them as well. Okay, thank you very much.